Hello everyone, my name is Rachel Moses and I'm a consultant respiratory physiotherapist and I specialise in long-term ventilation and weaning, so everything from intensive care, liberating people from ventilation, to mask ventilation in an acute ward environment, to home ventilation, and that also includes airway clearance and tracheostomy care. And I work in a NHS trust in the UK. So I am not an expert on pandemic. I am not an expert on viral illness. I'm certainly not an expert in terms of the ventilatory management of patients um, per se. Um, but what I am is a respiratory physiotherapist and I've been invited onto this physiopedia um, course um, to talk about the respiratory management of people presenting with COVID-19 to a bunch of physiotherapists. So I'm going to try and keep it in context as much as possible and I'm going to try and talk as much as I can about how we as physiotherapists have a role in the respiratory management of these patients while also giving you some insight into what we're learning from our colleagues who have been treating these patients from the very start of the pandemic. So our colleagues in China and our colleagues in Italy so hopefully you've had the chance to read um, and partake in the first part of the courses where you learn all about um, the coronavirus, um, particularly about COVID-19 as a, in a disease state of the, the coronavirus um, and how that manifests in terms of respiratory symptoms and affects the respiratory system itself. So I want you to remember, it's really important to remember that about 80% of people who contract this disease will have no symptoms or very mild symptoms and those patients really can be managed at home um, in self-isolation. Then we have about 14% of patients who will become unwell to the point they need admitted into hospital and at that point it's um, oxygen therapy is the key because generally most will present with lower oxygen levels below 93% predicted. And then we have about 5% of the population that will get so unwell they require intensive care admission and supportive therapies and call, including intubation and ventilation. Um, so if you imagine a patient, most especially all in the UK, will come in through our emergency department. And at that moment in time, patients are screened. So the screening process takes place at that moment in time. If anyone has any suspected signs of COVID-19, then they're automatically taken into source isolation and, and asked to wear a, a face mask for protection. And at that moment in time, that's when our infection prevention control measures will come into play. So a rapid screening process and identifying and identify patients who may be um, suspect or positive for COVID-19. And that's a really, really important learning point from our colleagues in Italy. So when we think about the disease process, we think about um, the categories of the disease state itself and the clinical syndromes that might exist. So we have the mild illness, we have the illness that may present with a fever, with a cough, um, and with other non-specific um, symptoms as well that you would associate with a viral um, and, um, pneumonia. So that then may develop onto the pneumonia stage. So that's, um, that can be classified as a mild pneumonia. There might be um, no need for supplementary um, oxygen, but the patients might be productive. They might have an increased sputum load. Um, but generally, we're, we're not really seeing that. We're just seeing a kind of viral illness take hold. And that may develop into a more um, significant or severe pneumonia where um, people will develop a high respiratory rate. So that tip typically is in the high 20s or over 30. Um, and they may start to develop signs of respiratory distress and have oxygen levels less than 93% for pneumonia. And that is when we're getting into the severe pneumonic type stages of the viral illness. And this may then lead on to an odds presentation. So an acute respiratory distress syndrome. 
and that can be anything between five to seven days from the onset of initial respiratory symptoms um, and there's very clear diagnostic criteria for for odds itself and it can be classified in terms of um, mild, moderate and severe and that's classified in terms of someone's PF ratio which is a ratio of partial um, oxygen pressure over a fraction of inspired oxygen. So we classify um, uh, respiratory distress syndrome in those manners and really at this point um, if someone is does develop a severe pneumonia or an acute respiratory distress syndrome um, and they're on supplementary oxygen and um, those decisions are made with regards to admission into the intensive care unit and potential intubation and mechanical ventilation. So as any admission to intensive care um, we would follow a series of steps. So if a patient is young, has no comorbidities and has a primary respiratory condition and um, the discussion would be normally quite brief with an intensive care consultant about a patient requiring elective intubation and ventilation. If someone has significant comorbidities or if they're frail or have coexisting respiratory disease, at this moment in time there would be discussions regarding escalation of treatment and admission into intensive care. For patients that have significant comorbidities um, or who are particularly frail, it may be that intensive care therapy is not in their best interests and certainly that will be a decision taken with the intensive care team and the emergency medicine team at that moment in time. So for patients that um, develop more severe pneumonias or ARDS. This is normally supported with oxygen therapy and supportive measures in the first instance. And then if the patients are deteriorating, they will go on to require more invasive um, or non-invasive methods of support. And at this moment in time, we might start to see radiological changes. So on, on x-ray, some patients um, have got CT scans um, and also the use of diagnostic lung ultrasound has been coming into play. And certainly a recent publication by the Chinese Critical Care Ultrasound Group did identify lung ultrasonography as a potential diagnostic tool in the assessment of COVID-19. Um, and how this might present. So it's showed very similar findings to um, radiological cases and could be used throughout the, the therapy um, process or throughout the treatment process to look at different stages to track the evolution of the disease, to monitor lung recruitment maneuvers, and to provide feedback in terms of um, success of some of those interventions, and also, also for making decisions around weaning from mechanical ventilation when we've got to that stage. So it's really important we have um, diagnostic tools as well to measure the stages of um, respiratory disease. So if we go back a step to the mild stage of the disease, so um, at that stage, normal oxygen support of measures would be used. So just um, face mask oxygen. And um, a majority of patients will be treated successfully with just face mask oxygen. However, as the disease starts to progress um, and takes hold, and maybe the development of viral pneumonia, at this stage, um, we will decide on the escalation plan. Now, there is some difference in opinion um, across uh, the world on the non-invasive ventilation strategies that we use, but certainly if we look at some of the Italian data and recommendations that are coming out, they very much found high flow nasal oxygen therapy beneficial at this stage. And it's important to recognize that they stipulate that this was in a selective patient group with hypoxemic respiratory failure, so they had no hypercapnia. And in adult patients, um, we can deliver high flow nasal um, oxygen therapy very effectively in this hypoxemic patient group with anything up to 60 litres of flow and 100% oxygen. And there's really strong evidence to support the use in hypoxemic respiratory failure, and it absolutely can prevent intubation in some patients. And the feedback from our Italian colleagues is that it may be particularly beneficial just with these patients um, who present with hypoxemic respiratory failure and they respond when therapy is given, particularly within the first hour. Um, again, our Italian colleagues report the CPAP 
via the hood or the helmet as a very effective strategy to manage hypoxemic respiratory failure in the early presentation of this disease. And in terms of their recommendations would be, it is something there, it's a tool that we can use. And again, it should be used in very select patients and you should see a symptomatic benefit, um, again, within the first hour for these patients. And um, certainly if in their cohort data, they would trial it, in selected patients and if it was effective they would continue on it and they had patients that would continue on these therapies um, for many days. And then we have non-invasive ventilation. So non-invasive ventilation is a recognised effective evidence-based intervention for patients with hypercapnic respiratory failure who present acutely unwell. Now non-invasive ventilation has been used in COVID-19 um, disease and it has been used effectively particularly in our, with our Italian colleagues um, and it's important to recognise their recommendations that if non-invasive ventilation is to be used again it's in a cohort of patients. Um, we know there's no role for um, non-invasive ventilation in severe hypoxemic respiratory failure or those with viral pandemic illness like we've seen from the SARS in the influenza studies. But we do know it may be beneficial in hypercapnic respiratory failure, particularly if the patient has respiratory comorbidities, for example, COPD. So it's very important that if non-invasive ventilation is used, it's delivered in a safe manner. And the Italians recommend using a dual limb system, so there's a separate expiratory port filtration system, or you use a double filter system, so you have viral filters that are placed um, between the mask and the expiratory port to help reduce the aerosolization um, and spread of the respiratory virus through droplet formation. So it's really important that if we do use these non-invasive measures that and those considerations are taken into place. So there is recommendations, certainly from um, the Italian team, in terms of preference that their first choice would be um, CPAP without humidification. So these patients just have HME filters, humidification isn't recommended. So CPAP with a helmet would be their first choice of intervention. And anything, um, PEEP levels, anything of 10 or above would be effective to meet the hypoxemic needs of these patients. Um, then would be CPAP by the mask, so that would be a second choice. And then would be NIV with a face mask, and they would use a full face mask or an or, or a nasal mask um, at least. And again, this is when they might want to consider the use of high flow nasal oxygen therapy as well for these, these, these hypoxemic patients. So again, the Italians um, found a categorization score very useful and they used a green, a yellow, an orange and a red system. And that was how well these patients responded to oxygen therapy or non-invasive measures. And that was how clinically um, decide if the patients needed to go on for um, elective intubation and ventilation. So if we think about those patients that either deteriorate really rapidly on oxygen therapy or they are, we've trialled them on non-invasive ventilation strategies and the patients are continuing to deteriorate, these are the patients that may go on to develop more emergency sign, which could include you know, airway obstruction or obstructive breathing patterns, or again become centrally cyanosed, um, they may develop associated shock or sepsis, um, or they may develop other multi-organ -invol involvement. Um, at that moment in time, if the, if the decision has been made the patient is for escalation, then they would be um, intubated at that stage. And it's really important that that happens in a controlled environment and there's full infection protection control measures taken. So in terms of management of patients at that point, um, the use of antibiotics in the presence of uh, sepsis um, may be considered um, and those antibiotics would generally be broad spectrum antibiotics to cover both gram negative and gram positive bacteria because these patients can sometimes have 
and superimposed infection, of course, underlying respiratory comorbidities as well. So empirical antibiotic treatment um, may be administered at that point. And in terms of fluid resuscitation, generally conservative fluid management is recommended for these patients who have no um, evidence of shock. Um, and that's um, to proceed with um, intravenous fluids cautiously because aggressive fluid resuscitation can sometimes adversely affect oxygenation, um, especially in the context of mechanical ventilation. So that's certainly recommendations. So if we go on to actual ventilation strategies, there's very clear guidance from previous um, viral pandemic studies and the cohort data that's coming out of, of China and Italy to adopt lung volume protection strategies. Um, and lung volume protection or lung protection strategies very much aim to protect the lung um, and this is achieved by um, Set having lower tidal volume settings, so anywhere in the range of 40 mils per kilogram of predicted body weight. Um, and combined with that, lower inspiratory driving pressures, so trying to achieve a plateau pressure, say, of less than 30 centimetres of water. And this protective mechanism attempts to reduce this all, um, any associated lung injury. And at that point, risk of hypercapnia may be recommended. So we don't worry too much if the carbon dioxide levels go out because achieving um, good oxygen levels is the key. Um, and this is fundamental in patients with moderate or severe ARDS. Um, and another strategy to achieve that is by adopting higher peak levels. And certainly some of the recommendations are peaks well above 10 or 15 centimetres of water. So generally these patients are sedated. Generally these patients um, have uh, our sedation levels to the point where we can adequate, adequately control ventilation, particularly in the acute stage of the disease process. Um, and again, it is good practice to perform daily sedation holds on critical care patients, but in the context of severe viral pneumonia and ERDS, we might choose to keep our patients under deep sedation until oxygenation improves. Um, and this is to help reduce ventilator to synchrony um, and control respiratory drive. And this is also important to achieve um, target volume and um, tidal volume targets. The use of neuromuscular blockade agents um, is generally not recommended in this patient group, again, unless we are seeing significant ventilator dyssynchrony um, in lung day recruitment. And at that point, that would be a discussion um, with the intensivist team to see if your patient um, does need paralyzed at that point to help effectively control ventilation. So if you have a patient that's mechanically ventilated and they may be um, you know, sedated, um, um, either in a deep sedation level or, or in a milder sedation level, um, they may not still be adequately ventilating. Um, and the use of recruitment maneuvers is discussed in some of the literature, but generally, um, it's not recommended in the severe ARDS phase. It may be more beneficial as the patients are weaning, so when the sedation's lightening, and if they are having episodes of day recruitment. And recruitment maneuvers are generally involve um, either an intermittent or an incremental increase in transpulmonary um, pressure. Um, and this can be achieved in a number of ways. And it's um, a maneuver that can be achieved either by keeping a patient on the ventilator or disconnecting the ventilator. So performing say manual hyperinflation or bagging, but this is absolutely not recommended in the context of viral, um, um, viral pneumonia because we're breaking the circuit and that will introduce aerialization. So respiratory droplets into the atmosphere um, and we absolutely do not re recommend that. Um, the other way to deliver um, hyperinflation is through ventilator recruitment maneuvers. And again, there's a variety of ways that this can be achieved, but this is a gradual or intermittent um, increase in transpulmonary pressure. Um, and there's no agreed protocol across centers on how to do this, but it might be having higher levels of um, inspiratory pressure, plateau pressure, peak pressure, um, or giving intermittent side breaths to help recruit. But there is absolute caution needed for 
people with an ARDS picture because we absolutely are trying to reduce the risk of ventilated associated lung injury um, and this might be inadvertently um, given during a recruitment renewal due to over distension um, and repeated opening of collapsed um, alveoli so again um, specific recruitment maneuvers are not recommended and um, disconnection of the ventilator is definitely not recommended um, unless it's um, completely unavoidable and certainly not for recruitment maneuvers themselves so that brings us on to positioning so if your patient's um, mechanically ventilated we might not have um, tools in our toolbox that we might normally have with regards to recruitment but positioning is really important and regular turns are absolutely recommended to prevent atelectasis to optimize ventilation and of course to prevent pressure sores so in terms of um, um, positioning this is generally just can be lateral so side lying but we may also want to explore prone ventilation um, as well and the use of prone positioning is well recognized to treat severe hypoxemic respiratory failure and it is proving to be a very effective in improving um, um, hypoxia um, related um, in COVID-19 and certainly this has been used very effectively in both the Chinese and Italian population of patients and in adult patients um, again going back to some of the literature around prone ventilation we generally want to keep patients on the front for about 16 hours a day and in some cases longer um, and again this is something that is used um, really effectively and um, involves a whole MDT effort to get someone over onto the front to, it requires resource it requires planning and it requires a good technique to avoid things like you know ET tube disconnection etc so there's some important points when it comes to um, when it comes to the, the treatment of, of patients on ventilation. Obviously, these patients generally have ET tubes in. We're not seeing a lot of um, tracheostomies in these patients, but we'll talk about that in a second. And it's really important that um, you know the cuffs remain inflated at all times, and they're they're not um, they're not deflated at all. Um, and the use of nebulizers is not recommended for these patients because of aerosol um, dispersion and also the use of um, cold water or warm water humidification is not recommended um, and heat and moisture exchange units are used instead. Closed suction is absolutely imperative um, and it's important it's not performed you know routinely like every hour or two um, as required and the use of um, bronchial alveolar lavage is not recommended as routine either and actually a lot of um, samples that can be taken effectively from normal tracheal suction um, um, as required so we from what we know about the respiratory management of these patients on intensive care units and the weaning phase is that tracheostomies have not been required on mass, which is great news to hear. Um, and there's not been significant reports of tracheostomies being required to liberate patients from mechanical ventilation. And if tracheostomies are indicated in this cohort of population, it may be wise to put a subglottic tracheostomy in situ so we can use things like above um, cuff vocalization um, without needing to reduce um, to deflate the cuff to help improve, improve communication and swallow um, and this obviously may help the communication phase um, for the patients in terms of their recovery so I've talked quite a lot about um, how we would manage these patients in the acute phase and obviously the use of non-invasive ventilation, high flow nasal cannula in the immediate respiratory phase, but this might also be adopted in the post-acute phase as well. And certainly some of the Italian recommendations is that it can be used effectively to bridge extubation and can be helped to support um, extubation in the intensive care unit and then also on the wards themselves. And respiratory management will absolutely continue post extubation and while we do not have data to, um, to suggest what happens in the long term respiratory um, effects of COVID-19 and the management, we are expecting to see similar um, respiratory problems um, 
after viral pneumonias. And these patients absolutely require an MVP approach post intensive care. Um, that is by a number of therapists and not just physiotherapists, a range of professionals, including occupational therapists, speech and language therapists, dietitians, and of course, psychologists who are going to play an absolutely huge role in the recovery phase of this, um, of this pandemic. So hopefully that's given you a little insight into the respiratory management of these patients um, and how we manage them. And we'll move on to the more specific um, respiratory physiotherapy and general physiotherapy interventions that these patients might have. Thank you.